Bonjour, bonjour et bienvenue dans cette session du dimanche matin, le jour où traditionnellement les rencontres d'Aix se projettent dans le futur. Alors nous allons passer un tout petit peu moins du So we're going to spend a little less than an hour together around uh, this topic is uh, take ownership of tech, what we can expect from new technologies, AI, 5G, big data, uh, quantum uh, elements. I don't know everybody, they'll say what they see in the future, our panel members, so what we uh, expect from the tech and what we want to avoid with the tech, this will be in our debate on how we take ownership. So Anne-Sophie in, in a few seconds will take the floor and share with you her vision of the uh, challenges. But b before that, I would like to introduce our uh, panelists, uh, Marine Chibou. Good morning, you're the European General Manager of Envision Digital. What can you say about Envision? Well, the Envision Group, thank you for the invite, first of all, is the world leader of uh, Uh, wind turbines, uh, uh, wind farms, it's an actor in the battery sector. People know us in France in the construction of the Douai battery plant that will supply Renault. We are special 100% in renewable energies and uh, digital activities are aimed at managing our uh, renewable installations, managing uh, smart cities and decarbonizing, decarbonating enterprise. So with you, we will address the tech and its usefulness in the Uh, ecological transition. Yes. Merwan Deba, good morning. You are a researcher in the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi. Before that, you directed all the research institutes of Huawei in France. Uh, you are on 4G technologies, 5G technologies. What do you focus on today? Today, I've joined the uh, Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi, which is in the logic of transforming the, uh, uh, the to a uh, 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 knowledge economy with a focus on 5G and in particular 6G today. And I'm a specialist of uh, all the information technologies, and this has been the case for more than 20 years, including IA. <coughs> Olivier Girard, good morning. President of Accenture, France and Benelux, and uh, So we're at the service of the transformation of the technologies of major enterprises, AI, Metaverse, Cloud. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Jean-Luc Robert, good morning. You uh, come from, uh, no, you're based in California, but you are a French corporation, Kiriba. Uh, yes, okay, Kiriba that I created in 20, 2005 is a leader in its trade um, for managing liquidities for enterprises. So. We have uh, 2,500 clients in the world. We're leaders in Europe and the, in the U.S. And uh, we manage the liquidities for uh, large-sized groups and medium-sized groups. So uh, to know about your liquidity, how you operate, how you manage your working capital, it's our trade in the cloud. So that's the tech we use. Yes, it's a, we work with the cloud. And Jean-Luc Robert is, is uh, said before uh, coming on stage, tech will save the world. So. Uh, Uh, quite enthusiastic. I will not agree with my <laughs> the person sitting next to me. A scientist, a politician, Cédric Villani, good morning to you. Cédric Villani, so where did you put your microphone? Mm, ah, it's in the spider. So <laughs> the, the, the tech stole it from me. Mathematician, Fields Medal, it means something. You're a former deputy, remember your uh, report on artificial intelligence um, to take ownership of the tech. This is uh, your question. The, The sovereignty, sovereignty, the usage, uh, question for individuals, uh, for society, technology always comes uh, with new possibilities and new uh, divides. Uh, it's a long story. It's a long story in the human race and its invention. So we promise we'll have a warm, hot debate here. So we're together until 10.10, very uh, accurate timing, you know, before listening to our um, Panelists, uh, our coordinator from the uh, Sac des Economistes, she teaches in uh, Ant Paris 1, Anne-Sophie Anne -Sophie, and Stephen, she will give us uh, the framework of this session. So good morning, everybody. Thank you, Alexandra. So to take ownership of the tech, it's a real challenge, more so since uh, with, you know, with a view to all the transitions that are, we're faced with, the uh, ecological transition, demographic transition, obviously digital. 
We saw it with the, the COVID crisis. Uh, digitalization is at the heart of everything and has um, uh, put at the forefront the losers and winners of these uh, te technological innovations. The 750 billion uh, euro plan of the uh, EU uh, uh, enables to all the states to allocate part of this money to the digitalization of enterprises. We saw that. A lot of debate during the COVID crisis, enterprises that were uh, uh, more intensely digitized, who had uh, taken ownership of the tech, uh, better resisted to this crisis. So, uh, unfortunately, other crises uh, are ahead of us, unfortunately, and for enterprises and the whole productive process, it's uh, uh, essential that we pivotal, that we take ownership of the tech and that we take into account the mutations in the pro productive process. Uh, more generally speaking, we also talked about productivity gains, and this was also uh, during the COVID crisis. There were a lot of worries um, with a view to this uh, and with the total confinement. How will uh, economic agents, households, and enterprises react? We saw that this technology enabled in several sectors to increase the productivity gains, uh, which were for enterprises a, a mean to resist and to um, uh, adapt to this crisis. Regarding ecology, here again, we managed to test this uh, at full scale during the COVID crisis. It uh, enabled a lot of workers, employees, to um, use less the transport to mo less mobility and for the uh, carbon uh, result for a lot of employees, uh, there was a great improvement due to uh, teleworking and all that was at the service of the transition. Technology is also well, a lot of, well, it's not a lot of sectors that will impact it. We talked about the health sector with uh, uh, telemedicine, which uh, enables to a lot of our um, fellow citizens to have access to this technology. Uh, when you know traditionally there was a, uh, a, a always a problem of efficiency and access to health care uh, there are examples that you've uh, probably heard to try to uh, push forward all the positive aspects <clears throat> put at the forefront uh, that we discussed uh, during the covid crisis uh, uh, while this tech has brought a lot economically there are also some uh, resistances crisis and worries uh, firstly, fractures or the divide, the digital divide. We often talk when there's a crisis of the winners and the losers. It's also the case for the digital revolution. Uh, citizens, uh, employees who haven't had access to training, proper training, who don't have access to these technologies, may have the feeling of being uh, a frustration, of being uh, declassified with a view to the uh, labor market. And we are. Uh, we face a problem as economists because we um, have a problem assessing the declassification and the, the impact it has on a society. Uh, and uh, with the revolution that's happening without us, so it cannot be assessed economically, but it has a very high social cost uh, that we leave the people on the side of the road in the, in the ditch. And if we don't take ownership of the tech and, and this revolution, we will all pay. And that's where uh, the different economic policies are pivotal to be able to integrate all the uh, employees, uh, sal salaried employees regarding training and the ownership of this tech. To conclude, beyond these, uh, this divide, these di there's also another issue that uh, arises is the polarization of wages in the present context. We talk about buying power. We see that the trades that are more technically oriented uh, that uh, have a potential of uh, productivity gains, well, the wages are higher in general. Another of the risks is this, uh, this uh, widening of this, uh, in these inequalities and polarization of salaries with, between those who've taken ownership of the tech and those who stay, uh, steer clear from that or stay away from this. So these are the elements I would like to put on the table for our discussions and have a good debate. Thank you, and sophie the world, the floor is yours. Taking ownership of the tech, maybe we'll talk about a positive tonality and the tech and the uh, ecological potential. What is technology for? More efficiency, more comfort, 
and more well-being, more efficiency in the plants, in transports. We carried out a study. Uh, we took five sectors that are the oil and gas sector, power sector, energy sector, uh, aviation, uh, health, and railroads. So if we do 1% of uh, efficiency gain on over these sectors uh, during 15 years, this will generate 276 billions of profits that can be re-injected in innovation. If we uh, can carry out work on smart cities, for smart cities, with, for well-being, the citizens will feel better. But furthermore, what we estimate is that in smart cities can bring 20 billion years of benefits or dollars, I don't know, uh, uh, profits uh, by 2050 if we implement connect, better connectivity, we improve transport, we reduce emissions and we improve energy uh, the energy uh, consumption. Today we have a very ambitious project, Smart Nation Singapore, where we connected all the sectors uh, in a, a digital platform. <clears throat> we collect the data of the buildings. Uh, buildings. Uh, People who like you and us, uh, you and me, and the, the, the skyscrapers where people work in industrial parks that are aimed at uh, reaching the zero carbon in ports and airports. <clears throat> so we worked during the COVID period. We see that we could, we saw that we could go beyond technology. Uh, uh, is that when we had COVID, that we were asked to develop apps on that, and so today. We managed to uh, lower by three to five percent the impact on health, uh, the emissions by 30 percent. And so this is the uh, well-being side. Uh, 10,000 cities signed the off Myers uh, framework saying that we committed, that was before 2020, we are committed to lower by 20 percent our emissions, minus, uh, lower 20 percent of uh, energy consumption and plus 20 percent of renewable energies. So uh, on the comfort side, it's simple. I have a phone. I want to be contactable everywhere. I want to, to hire Uber, Uber, for example. For efficiency, comfort and well-being. That boils down to. And this should sum up uh, what technology can provide uh, so that for the users and for society. Thank you, Merwan. In Abu Dhabi, uh, Merwan Deba, uh, in Abu Dhabi where you work, what do you promise with 6G and artificial intelligence? Well, thank you. First of all, a little anecdote. So about 10 years ago when I was on this panel, uh, such panels, there were a lot of discussions on innovation and less on progress. And since 2020, in particular with all the efforts of the UN, uh, with the 17 objectives for uh, sustainable development, uh, we, we talk a lot more about progress than innovation. And it's a, the new awareness, and this is fine because we know there's a big difference between innovation and progress. And today we see a strong correlation between technological developments and progress. Even though we will talk in the second uh, phase, uh, in chapter of our debate, that there's some negative aspects. But the important aspect is telecommunication networks, 5G, 6G. On the 5, 6G uh, aspect, there are a big effort by uh, operators, constructors, to reach the objectives uh, of consumption reduction. And today, the 5G networks consume uh, 10 times, 100 times less, I'm sorry, compared to what we had with the 4G. And the progress we've made uh, today were, are mainly due to the fact that the uh, flow rates uh, continue to increase, uh, but there's an effort of sobriety that we need to continue on 6G. These progress are uh, highlighted, in particular my teams are working on that, where we have uh, drastic uh, objectives around a factor of uh, 100 uh, uh, less consumption compared to 5G, so we're working intensely, intensely on that. A lot of efforts need to be made, uh, optimization efforts uh, that need to be done on that. And on the IA portion, a lot of things are done, in particular uh, with servers, a lot of work done on the optimization of servers in terms of uh, uh, energy consumption, uh, exploiting the data and reducing consumption. And so these are two aspects on internal technologies, but uh, we don't talk about the collateral aspects on the whole of society in particular, uh, on the technological aspect, uh, all the evolutions we witness are uh, uh, less uh, for consumption than for verticals. The information technologies are not used to be consolidated, but the targets we have in all these fields are uh, mainly verticals. Verticals, well, that's health, that's transport, 
and so on and so forth. And on this, we can achieve a lot of productivity gains while being uh, gains as, uh, as underlined. And interesting evolutions on artificial intelligence. We uh, the uh, IoT uh, sensors uh, uh, enable to um, make the infrastructures evolve, in particular what we call uh, the smart grids, <clears throat> the uh, intelligence added to all the networks, uh, and on which, whether for buildings or for the, we have a, a big uh, reductions, insulation uh, <clears throat> uh, improvements, and this is in line with the uh, IA, 5G, 5, 6G technologies. I will correct uh, uh, on the screen. You did, uh, uh, it said uh, Huawei, no, but you're working at the TII Technology Innovation Institute in, in Abu Dhabi and no longer Huawei. Olivier Girard, Accenture. For you, progress <clears throat> that we should expect from the tech. What do you, t well, I'll talk on behalf of. Uh, my customers and uh, my preamble is on three observations. For, I think we're uh, uh, on a very strong breaking point in terms of technologies. Uh, uh, a lot of responsibility, a lot of promises. Three points, and that was mentioned by Anne Sophie in the introduction. The tech is an incredible lever for productivity and innovation. And I'll go back on that. But what I mean to say here, it's ahead of us. If I take the cloud as a, an advanced indicator of the framework where we can innovate, 30% of the world has shifted to the cloud. So the essential is ahead of us. And that's good news. Innovation, Bruno Le Maire uh, mentioned this. Is My best example is the CEO of Moderna, who says when he managed to produce his air and messenger vaccine, he couldn't have done it without the calculation power of the cloud. So the vaccine and cloud. Uh, the capacity to automatize, automatize uh, tasks that we haven't really assessed as of now, but a lot of potential there. Second topic is uh, on macroeconomics, which is a bit darkened. Geopolitics is tense. Uh, are tense. Uh, will enterprise carry out their investment in such a, a scope, in such a, a context? The answer is yes. Uh, they say they want to continue to control themselves for the first reason I gave for you know productivity innovation gains but also because something has changed with the COVID technology has become an ally an essential ally in the management of crisis and this is an, a novelty it's true for uh, ecology it was mentioned already and it's true also for the supply chain issue. Uh, the situation in Ukraine disorganized the world. We have to reorganize flows, stocks, and this again, uh, the technology will do that. I think it's a wonderful uh, asset. Uh, technology is a factor of resilience of enterprises and, and, and people. And this last point is more on the micro macroeconomical standpoint. It was mentioned by, um, uh, by uh, Elizabeth Bond yesterday. Uh, the technology is is, defla uh, is deflationist through the productivity gains it brings in itself. When you look at the cost of hardware over 10, 20, 30 years, it's dropping continuously. So the trade itself is uh, uh, deflationistic and uh, it brings a lot of savings. And this makes it a very strong element against inflation. It was what Christine Lagarde, I'm sorry, I'm sorry stressed yesterday. It wasn't uh, Elizabeth Bond, but Christina Olivier Girard, thank you for the intelligent smart networks, the tech that brings forth progress, uh, well being, uh, managing crisis. Uh, uh, Moderna, uh, who couldn't have achieved this uh, vaccine, vaccine without the tech. Um, Monsieur Kiriba, what would you say on tech and how it will save the world? So I come from the world of enterprises. In uh, Jean-Luc Robert huh, from Kiribati, so I, I think that the tech we see it through uh, Kiribati Solutions enable enterprises to survive, to make progress, to maintain the employment rate, <clears throat> continue to uh, make progress. Uh, let's take the rule of the three C's. Uh, the three events that happened recently, the COVID, first of all, the 13th of March 2020, all the enterprises um, you know, were no longer operational, the confinements, you have to uh, telework, have to work on uh, different uh, uh, time schedules uh, with the children at home and uh, from one day to the other you had to continue to be operational and you have to make sure that the company would the, the enterprise would continue to produce their results and be operational second aspect climate the second c it's uh, uh, the tech that will enable to control the climate 
At Kiribati, for example, we, are, we manage to control uh, indicators that will be uh, required by legislators on the uh, climate management. These indicators are not very well defined. There are indicators that are quantitative, like the carbon footprint, which is easy to manage with, but more qualitative also indicators. How can we be sure that such and such a supplier doesn't have uh, children under 12 years work in their factories and uh, deep down in India? And the only way you can control that and, and to keep updated is the uh, technology. And the third thing after the COVID, the climate, it's uh, the conflict, conflict. We talk about Ukraine. Uh, uh, enterprises have to continue to work despite this war. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, live through the, the, the sanctions. Uh, you know that European states and U.S. American states are not joking about that. Something that you need to implement overnight. Uh, you have to find new suppliers because uh, uh, the supplies in uh, in uh, Belarus and uh, Ukraine, while well, they can no longer work with you, you have to make cash cash advances, and that's a, the tech. The tech can help you on that. So, in, in a more more difficult conflict management era, uh, uh, the tech will help you a lot. So, I took these examples on the enterprises that we know that are oriented on the management of uh, cash and liquidities, but there are th thousands of enterprises. There are tens, dozens, and dozens of Kiriba uh, type. Uh, enterprise that are created every year and so little by little these uh, small ri rivers will make and uh, these small streams will make uh, major rivers and to, to enabling us to survive in a changing world uh, so one word uh, what is I live in California it's fascinating because when you are a young entrepreneur in California and you uh, look for money and for people to finance your project the first question that you're asked is how will you change the world how will you save the world and I think it's a positive p standpoint, uh, something that it's all to perceive in Europe, uh, or understand in Europe, but I'm uh, convinced, and I see it uh, concretely, practically. I, I have friends who created enterprises that enable to work, to produce uh, digital meat, to extend the life of uh, perishables uh, for fruit, for example, uh, and to extend their uh, life uh, cycle. It's, uh, it can be very important for to fight uh, famine in the world. So changing the world, there are constraints that will give rise to problems. It's a tectonic plate that is moving, uh, and uh, but I think it's it's, it's positive, and, uh, and we'll have to uh, company and take ownership of all this. Cedric Villani. So humans can take ownership in tech of tech to make the world more wonderful. Let me give you some examples of things that I've seen closely where the arrival of tech improved things. It's something that is cross-cutting. It helps everyone. Each time you have a conflict, it will help those who are on the good side and the bad side. But I have some examples that I've seen where the impact was very positive. And the first one is the functioning of the parliament in France. At the beginning of our mandate, we saw that uh, the civil servants were coming by with piles and piles of paper for the amendments that were given to the members of parliament and were thrown out before they were even read. But between 2017 and 2022, the digitalization of parliament happened and you can find any amendment that's been filed by a specific person at such date and uh, the order of passage, you can find that quite easily with a well thought out interface and which allows the elimination of uh, the printing of tons and tons of paper and has improved the democracy. Let me talk about mathematics also. The most important transformation in um, mathematics was the invention of a tool called tech, and it's called L-E-T-E-C, la tech, the invention uh, by the great uh, uh, living legend of maths, uh, Mr. Knup, who gave back to mathematicians and maths the ownership of their articles and their books. 
doing the work that editors and publishers were doing in the past, but doing it now with more precision. This improves uh, democracy. It's it standardized the way mathematical documents are being exchanged and published across the world. So this LaTeX is 100% of communication in maths internationally. A third example that I'm involved in as a member of the Academy of Science, that's the link between AI and health. This is one of the pillars of my 2018 report. So far, it's not been appropriately implemented. It's not at scale for different reasons that I won't address here. But AI plus santé, this field domain, has remarkable capabilities and already some performances in terms of diagnostics. The best uh, uh, diagnostic tool is an algorithm and not a human for certain diseases and for some uh, treatments. The tracking of certain cohorts uh, can detect a very uh, low signals. So it's a work done between uh, the Academy of Medicine and Mathematicians. And I've been working with Mr. Lord Linger from the Academy of Medicine. And we've come up with some great developments. And the last thing I want to talk about is the question of remote working and communication via remote working, via video conferences. It's true that it's a revolution with positive ecological impacts if it's properly developed. This supposes clearly that you need to play the game and reduce physical travel to do uh, the, the, the work. I love to travel I by plane and now I'm at one flight per year. I used to take taxis all the time. I got rid of my taxi application off my phone and, and I don't uh, travel by taxi anymore. So you got rid of some tech by getting rid of your application. Sometimes you have to get rid of things that are not uh, useful. So progress, resilience, well-being, as Anne-Sophie said, there are people who are left by the wayside. The digital divide affects the, mo the elderly, the l less uh, well-equipped. And there is a danger with tr tech. Remember Barack Obama who called Trump a total idiot in 2018. That was artificial intelligence. It was a deep fake video that was produced. So what can we say to people who are worried, for those who are left by the wayside, for those who are worried, anxious? You talk about smart cities, but some people feel this is constant surveillance. Intelligent electrical networks were already mentioned, and I'm going to go beyond uh, smart cities. I was lucky to be one of the co-founders in 2005 of the European Smart Grid. And one of the first stages of the Smart Grid was be able to measure what we consume. How can we improve energy consumption if we don't know what people are consuming? And that was the big problem. So there was this initiative to say in the third energy package that we needed 80% of citizens of our European customers, 250 million, equipped with intelligent meters. The Netherlands uh, did this very quickly. They launched this project and deployed intelligent meters. We did it in France with Linky. People were resistant. The citizens saying we're going to be uh, watched. People are know what I'm going to be doing, when I'm taking a shower, etc. So we took a step back. At the time, I was the president of the European Association of Intelligent Meters. And we said that we would define the way in which we could address the problem. We did a cost-benefit analysis about why we need to deploy intelligent meters in all countries and the benefits that they can provide. We would explain to the benefit, individual benefits to citizens. They can master their energy consumption. Today, if we citizen, create citizens' energy communities in 2050 in France, we can have twice the equivalent of the production of our nuclear fleet. So when you have the possibility of producing your own energy, of charging your electric vehicle, of storing, it, the intelligent meters will allow you to measure this in real time. We're no longer in a world where we're extrapolating from past consumption levels. So there's an explanation for the benefits that this could provide and that we want to go beyond. We want to go beyond just measuring electricity consumption. So there's some 30 companies in France that are all intended to work on smart cities, to propose to customers, be they residential customers, industrial customers, 
retail and medium-sized industry, explain to them that we're capable of providing benefits in terms of your consumption will reduce your energy bill thanks to technology which is capable of measuring capable of managing buildings the way you would m manage an electric vehicle two we're capable of reducing your carbon emissions your consumption and provide more well well-being more comfort we're running out of time Merwan The darker sides of tech. What do you say to people who say, well, 6G is uh, going to be uh, dangerous? That's always been the case. People who develop technologies uh, sometimes want to go too quickly and don't spend enough time, the time that's required to integrate the entire ecosystem in the de development. I look at 5G and 6G, we realized that we needed to explain this technology, the ecosystem, the choices that are made, and to understand why we made these choices and also to report on what's happening today in the developments that are being made in the 6G roadmap, this is already taken into account. There'll be a huge effort in explanation and scientists need to spend more time on uh, plateaus such as this one. Cedric does it very well to explain the developments, why it's uh, being uh, cr created so that everyone can have a, 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 an easy explanation. The second aspect is we need to get people to we need to empower people in terms of technology. The researchers like Cedric talked about la tech. When people write scientific papers today, we're at, they're asked to put their carbon, the carbon footprint of their research in the solution. That's very interesting because all of the conference calls, all of the travel, all of the GPIs that they use to write the paper or do the research has to be included in the report. For this scientific discovery, I consumed this much. That's a first step and it will become more generalized when uh, uh, research projects are financed. We're going to ask people to report on their carbon footprint and I think that this is uh, very important. Thirdly, the differences between uh, employees, the capacity to develop and the huge effort has to be made for training continuous training. I, in Abu Dhabi, we realized that there was a huge gap in terms of the appropriation of certain technology and we decided to employ people who were just graduated from university or high school so that they could start working and be trained in different universities. So we work with them, we support them as employees and we integrate them into our technological roadmaps. And this is something that's going to become increasingly relevant to be able to train people, these young people, uh, continuously in the use of these technologies. And also, this is going to be important for seniors to take it into account in the different roadmaps that we have so that they can take ownership of these technologies. Olivier Girard, there are lots of questions around tech. There's the regulations, the concentration of stakeholders, the sharing of value, which is not always optimal between different actors, the inclusive uh, nature or not of tech, its carbon footprint, questions of sovereignty. There are lots of topics. I'm going to focus on three. Firstly is the carbon risk of the technology. It's 2 to 4 percent, depending on the study. The carbon footprint is 2 to 4 percent. If we project what we're doing now in the opening of data centers, the increase of traffic on the networks in 10 years, it's going to be 10, 12 percent, and it becomes problematic. At two, you're, you're uh, hidden. At 12, you're very visible. The way to fight against this uh, is... Uh, is complicated. Not everyone has the courage to take applications off their phone or to reduce their energy consumption or use the cloud. So there are drivers. The cloud is one of them. We can share means through the cloud. But the easiest way, the strongest way will be controlling our use of data. There was a contradictory message saying we spend our time talking to our customers saying the more data you have, the smarter you'll be in your decision making and the customization of your relationships with customers. But you need to be frugal at the same time to not penalize your carbon footprint of the technology. There are technologies that are arriving. We call them long data, low data algorithms. So we look at uh, our what we keep in terms of our records. Then uh, the second topic concerns talent. 
we, we know we're missing talent and we're going to be missing more talent in future. Today, I would just like to say that remote working, which is different than just pulling a, a cable into your living room, it's a deep reorganization of work. It's a great driver. A barrier has come down. We can put the expertise of the world uh, at, at the at more available to solve complex problems, and this is a great tool. We can also hire people who were very far from technology centers, and I also think that that's a very positive thing. The last question is the social divide. More, ten, more than 10 million French people don't have an email address. 15 million people in France can't work from home. So I'd like to give two tangible examples. One that uh, is in line with what Marwan said. We often have the image of tech as a scientific, technical, male occupation. Indeed. And that's not quite true. We have tangible examples with the associations that we work with, where we bring people who are quite far away from technological professions to back to them. It takes a few months. And then once we've done these few months of training, of uh, uh, study training groups, 76% of these people find jobs in tech. Last Thursday before I came to X, we were working on the question of mentorship with Article 1, and I, I would, I'm happy to talk about this. They use digital. They have platforms, digital platforms, where they have matching algorithms between young people who need mentors to accelerate their school career, to improve their self-confidence, and uh, mentors. So there's a matching algorithm, and they use digital marketing technologies to recruit young people who need this mentoring and who don't necessarily know it. Everyone has a smartphone in hand, so we can reach this. It, last year, we impacted 20,000 people, and next year, 40,000 people. There are other associations that are exceptional in the work that they're doing. It's not just mentorship, but without digital, they reach two to three million people a year. So digital can help us scale this up. Jean-Luc Robert. So what conditions are necessary to uh, take ownership of tech? We're seeing in this panel that it's an inevitable movement. We're at the beginning. We're talking about increasingly complicated things. It's, uh, it's inevitable. It will go quickly. It will progress um, much more quickly than we've seen for changes in the past. So we really need to buy into it to take ownership. So the first uh, level is companies where people use tools, and we see that one of the impacts that we're working on is training. We're training people. We're checking to make sure they're using the products. If they don't use them, we train them for free to make sure that they're up to date, that they're capable of doing their job properly and of taking ownership of the tool. As, as a parent, if they can do it, they can pass this on to their children. The second aspect is, is this inevitable movement. It's something that's going to happen. It's an element of culture. Today, the place to acquire tech is in school. You have to stop filling the reservoir. We talk about people who have been downgraded, who are, uh, who are away from progress. But the problem is that the training tool for people on a is really school. We talk about, Bruno Le Maire talked about culture, French culture. Isabelle Bond talked about mathematics yesterday and the appropriation of classic languages. People have to take a tech at the same level. We have to teach this to kids in school as of six years old so that they're familiar with these tools, so that they're capable of using a computer. So we have to work on this problem. There's a question of transfer. We're at a breakthrough point uh, where we're seeing a lot of people who are downgraded in their, so, in their social standing. At Kaiba we're, think, Kariba, we're thinking about how we contribute to the professional integration of people into companies. It's an important element to work with these uh, 
structures. I, th I really think this is a movement that we cannot stop, and we need to get people to take ownership of the tools. We need to change the school system in a very concrete way. It's not very complicated, and I think that there's a, a role uh, between companies and the state to solve this problem, and then we need to solve more complicated problems. But I think that Olivier gave some good examples. There'll always be a drift in, in technological change. We look at the role of the social media, they calling it anti-democratic, etc. But it's a change in civilization, it's a change in culture, and we need to uh, we need to own it, we need to do uh, make sure that it goes as, as well as possible for companies and for individuals. So tech problems, uh, drift, uh, misuse, there are solutions. Cédric Villani, do you share this point of view? Careful. In many cases, we're tricked by orders of size. We say that positive is this small and the negative can be huge. To give you just one example that's not directly teched, plastic, we can, we can make ourselves feel good by talking about re recycled plastic, but when you look at order of size, the only sustainable way to fight against uh, plastic pollution is at the global scale is to produce less plastic. If you look at the APEX report on this topic that was published a, a year ago, so today, it, are we reducing our production of plastic? No, it's, we're, it's actually climbing and will continue to climb in the coming years. There's a rebound effect. If you gain a factor of 10 in efficiency and you multiply by 100, the volume exchanged, uh, you're, it's a losing calculation. And this is why the High Council for the Climate estimated with in an unambiguous manner that uh, 5G, a passage to 5G was bad for the environment. There's also the problem of the construction of, gi of giant digital actors. That was the question of one of the recent roundtables. I remember a minister of an Asian country who explained with examples that AI is the most uh, is the tool that will increase inequalities the most. Their technology is sometimes perverted and there are side effects that you don't anticipate and you're going to have to spend a much more money to offset the, the side effects than you had to invest at the beginning. This, critical, this criticism isn't new and it's not only for, for, high, for tech. It's uh, Kathy O'Neill published a book five years ago, an excellent book on the weapons of math destruction. That was five years ago. I suggest that you read it. Ivan Ilyich wrote about the importance of controlling the development of certain technologies. And he said that a bicycle is more uh, efficient than a car. And if we go back to his reasoning with electric vehicles, it's even truer. Four years ago, I would have said the future of mobility, what will uh, change things is going to be electrical, autonomous, shared uh, travel. I agree, now say that it's electric vehicles that should replace most cars in the world if we really want to fight against uh, global warming. Sixty years ago, Planet Interdite was a science fiction film that talked about this civilization that was killed by its own creations, the technology that g took on their imagination and their uh, fantasies and it ended up destroying them. This science fiction movie, movie was mentioned in uh, as an allegory of what we're doing with the technology today and I will conclude by talking about the criticism by Socrates against writing explained with solid arguments that writing would lead to more misunderstandings because the content would be given to people that it was not intended for and it would lead to an impoverishment of our memory and our inherent knowledge because we would rest on writing and people would not try to understand themselves but refer to writing. These three criticisms are so true today when we see what's going on in classrooms and political discourse on social media that's been criticized by David Charriaz called toxic data where we have problems that we need to really look at full on in order to deal with them properly. So we have nine minutes left. 
We'll give one to Anne Sophie for the conclusion. And in the room, are there any questions? Hands going up, the young lady in the front, and then the gentleman. Milady. Thank you for your presentation. So uh, we talked about the limits of electronism. And I'm in charge of prospective studies. And uh, we already drafted a document on the emerging risk of technologies. Yeah, how do you, as uh, controllers of the tech, uh, master the cyber risk? We know it's a major uh, element. Uh, how do you apprehend this? And what advice do you give to, uh, notably Accenture, to enterprises to better accompany them to master this cyber risk? So this gentleman's question, yes. If there are others, I'll take three questions. So uh, please raise your hands. Good morning. Thank you. First question, I'm surprised. Uh, with all the speakers today that none have talked about the social the Chinese social credit system which is a kind of uh, yeah, uh, it's a perverse use of technology uh, and the second question uh, since we're talking about education there were in the in 1966 there was a reform of maths in uh, France, the, the modern mathematic reform by a great mathematician, Mr. Lusterovich, and he, there was a, a question of learning the binary, of teaching the binary system to children to prepare them to the use of uh, computer sciences, and this revolution uh, just uh, was abandoned a few years uh, after because the, the system was more conservative than what was attempted. So, isn't it? Uh, a mirage when you think of uh, you can renovate the educational system the last uh, this lady here please uh, brief question good morning i will uh, my question is for mr vinani in relationship with the tax and inequalities and mr this gentleman's question on the inequality between girls and boys notably uh, because of the reform on mathematics at school uh, because we are reintroducing mathematics, but a very small scale in the school, French school system. So thank you. So we have the cyber risk, uh, social credit in France, in uh, China, and um, diversity. So Accenture, that was approached. I was uh, talking about education and the cyber risk. Because I'd like to go back on education. There's an analogy I like very much. When I started my studies, I was told you have to be bilingual. You have to speak English. You have to speak the universal language. I think the, the issue of school that was raised at my left and here again, and we have to succeed in the fact that technology is uh, really integrated in the educational system. We have a technique at Accenture, we call it the technological uh, IQ. Everybody in society should increase its uh, technological uh, quotient, uh, TQ. Uh, so uh, cybersecurity shouldn't be black, black boxes. It can be misused and we have to go beyond that to understand what's behind this. There's a real uh, educational stake here. On cyber security, I would say that when I uh, talked about the technology as an ally in the management of crisis, cyber is a very important element. Since the COVID, imagine the number of cyber attacks on enterprises and individuals was multiplied by two, three. Uh, so globally, the system uh, withheld those attacks. So there are ways to uh, to, 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 to face all this. Uh, so I'll talk about the cyber risk. Uh, we talk about the cyber risk. It's an uh, integral part. Uh, it's uh, under pressure, under stress. Uh, um, uh, you make progress, but there's a risk. It's because there's competition that uh, uh, this happens. It's because there's cyber that applications uh, pro make progress, so we continue to invest. It's a risky game, but it's not risk more risky than there was a uh, industrial spining, you know, or, so it's part of accepting the development of technology, but enterprises will have to spend more and more, invest more and more. It's a risk, but it's also what makes the strength of, uh, because you are, makes our strength because you're constantly uh, facing the risks and that you need to master. As far as education in school, I think the tools have changed since then. Today, uh, the binary, mathematics well in video games children children take ownership of video games and uh, things are becoming more intuitive and more collaborative so it's something that's easy to integrate in in the programs the technology has changed uh, the setting 
So two additional questions, one on diversity uh, for Cédric Villani and uh, an important question on the Chinese social credit scheme. A few words, but uh, very short, uh, in a nutshell on this question, uh, human resources in the educational system. You can do what you want, an educational system can be supported, but it's first of all the teachers and uh, with the human system that will do the job. And it's the pride, efficiency, well-being, training. Uh, the, the humans make the, the educational system. And the, 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 the other uh, reform failed, uh, as others. We can talk about the health problem. We're talking about artificial intelligence itself. It doesn't uh, keep us from having all these human beings that are rigorous and well trained. Ten years ago, a well known economist made a big declaration. He said that by 2020, we'll have, we'll meet half the people in the hospitals. Well, no comment. And we can say the same thing everywhere. Tech will help, but it, it doesn't uh, save you from. Uh, uh, if you want to do the ecological transition, and you will not. We need to reduce our meat consumption, to, uh, as a concrete example. The ghost countries that invest in the more in the digital sector in education saw their educational level drop. There's a UNESCO study, their perverse effects. So one minute, who will talk about the Chinese social credit? Uh, equality, uh, men and women, yes, I will uh, propose the reference. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence without them, women. And so systematically, there's been a trend to increase the inequalities between men and women. It's true with the reform of the high school degree. But the main topic in mathematics is primary school. Mathematics is in primary school. So I'll be blamed for this 30 seconds on the Chinese uh, social credit and surveying society. So 30 seconds each. So on the surveying society, each time you need to develop an application, you need to also develop alongside everything that enables to protect each other from uh, surveillance and cybersecurity. We're asking everybody who develop app applications to do this on the social credit in China. There's always a risk and there are uh, enterprises uh, where there's a risk of surveillance, but we're protected from that in our countries. And I think we have to look at the advantages technology can bring forth today. Uh, you use uh, alarms at home, in your homes, you need uh, mobile apps, uh, you can have your data that are in the hands of your energy supplier. This, you have to prop, use them properly and have all the firewalls and protections needed. Uh, last point I'd like to raise is the simplification. What we would need is before talking about education with a view to technology in school, you have to uh, teach everybody to develop simple applications if the major success in on the iPhone and the use of technologies today successful technology is because they're simple to use and the complexity was left to the people who developed the applications thank you and Sophia see conclusion few words uh, we said that the, we saw that the debate was vivid on how you take ownership of the tech the question is the digital revolution is there will it be an opportunity or not you said it, uh, it's a real challenge in terms of productivity gain. We saw that during the COVID crisis. What about the future? Uh, the technology to, uh, can be a good or bad thing depending on how we use it. And it's uh, humans that decide how they take ownership. Thank you. Thank you all. Merci à tous nos intervenants. Thanks to all our guest speakers and for this uh, very interesting debate.